right? Instead of how can I do everything to prepare them, it's how can I get out of their way so they can learn all the stuff they'll need to be able to do ultimately when I'm gone. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, this is Danae, and that voice you heard in the intro is Julie lithcott Hames. Julie is an author, an educator, and a politician. She's a former dean of freshman and undergraduate advising at Stanford. And her work at the university level inspired this book we're about to talk about today, How to Raise an Adult, Break Free of the Overparenting Trap and Prepare Your Kid for Success. Julie is a New York Times bestselling author, a TED speaker, a lawyer, she holds degrees from Stanford, Harvard Law, and she's also a mother. And although her work may have inspired this book, her personal experience is deeply embedded within it. Thanks for tuning in. I think you're going to love this chat with Julie. Hi, Julie. How are you? Danae, I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be with you. Yeah. Well, I just finished reading your book, How to Raise an Adult. And so many of the themes in this book, which I know you wrote quite a few years ago, so many of those themes really resonated with me. Well, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad and I'm sad, right? I, I identified a problem that was percolating in our culture, this overparenting phenomenon, because I was seeing the effects of it at the college level as a dean working with students 18 to 22 years old and kind of curious about why their parents we're still doing a lot of handholding and why the young person didn't seem to mind. And so I sort of spotted this problem and, and wrote about it with the very sincere hope that everybody would read the book and change their behaviors. And of course that's naive. Um, it's hard to tackle a systemic problem and, uh, and, and really make any uh, significant shift. That said in the close to eight years that the book has been out, I've had so many conversations with so many parents who themselves have said, I get it. I know what I'm doing. I have to figure out how to stop. And of course, I come with all this compassion because while I was a dean tutting what I was seeing other parents do to their college students, I came to realize I was doing the exact same stuff with my own kids who were younger at the time and who are now college age. So All of those chickens have come home to roost for me. I have seen myself embedded in the very problem that I'm an expert, air quotes, on. And it's been a really humbling, eye-opening experience for me to navigate my own parenting journey as an expert on the subject uh, to discover, hey, I'm doing it too. It's just given me that much more compassion for why parents do it and how parents do it. Uh, But the urgency that I feel for us to kind of switch things up and repattern remains because I've seen the harmful effects. Yes, I I couldn't agree more. And I've covered this topic on the podcast before, this idea of overparenting. And I I actually read Excellent Sheep by Bill DeRezowitz and had him on the podcast in my first year of motherhood. So Mm -hmm. it was when I had an infant. I read that book. And I remember reading that book because it's really about college students, essentially. And I remember reading that as a new mom of an infant, um, feeling like it was really important. Mm. However, now that I reflect back, I feel like that was just kind of a red flag for overparenting that I'm reading a book about college preparation when I had an infant. Good point. (laughs) Great insight. Yeah. And to be able to acknowledge that, like, why was I reading a book related to college students when I'm holding my infant? And you nailed it, right? right? You're like, I need to get a jump start. I need to make sure I'm prepared. What do we need to do to prepare this tiny infant to be successful in college? So I love that you're naming it because we're all doing it. And we we have to read we have to focus on books instead that are about how do I build character in my child? How do I build work ethic in my child? How do I teach my child to do more and more for themselves every year so that they become capable 
of looking after themselves and, and succeeding on their own and picking themselves up when things go wrong as they will, right? Instead of how can I do everything to prepare them, it's how can I get out of their way so they can learn all the stuff they'll need to be able to do ultimately when I'm gone? Yeah. Well, and one of the things you discuss in your book is that sometimes when we step back and let our kids step up, other people around us have opinions about that and don't really necessarily understand that we're being proactive and we look lazy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the mom wars um, are brutal in some communities, by which I mean the extent to which we feel the need to comment upon, comment about, judge someone else's parenting style and really measure our worth as moms and dads. I think dads do it too sometimes um, based on how much we appear to be doing for our kids. And so those who aren't doing for are seen in such communities as lazy or neglectful. So this is where we really need experts like you and listeners like the amazing people in your community to help change the narrative from it's not loving to do for them. It's loving to let them learn to do it themselves. We can get biblical about this, you know, um, give a man a fish, he eats for a day, give a person a fish, teach a person to fish and they can fish forever. And that's a great little visual to impose on parenting, you know, right? We don't, we don't want to just show up and rescue our kid unless they're in a true emergency. We want to actually allow that to be a learning experience so they can do it for themselves tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. So changing the narrative is, is key. You know, I'm not neglecting, I'm teaching. There are also great organizations that, you know, if someone's curious, like, Hey, no, actually I follow the methods of letgrow.org, which is a wonderful nonprofit that's really reminding us that our job is to let our children grow and get out of their way so they can grow. And you can give somebody that link and then they can look at the website, which is going to have articles and suggestions about things, practical things you can do to build skills, build confidence, build independence in your kid. Um, so it's, you know, it's counteracting, uh, a movement that's been afoot for 30 years or more, this overparenting stuff, it's counteracting it with a different way. Right, right. And I, I, there was a quote in your book that said um, something lines of grow wildflowers, not bonsai trees. Yeah. that That's going to stick with me. I really like that. <laughs> you know, I appreciate that. It actually became the focus of my TED Talk, which came out in the fall of 2016, Um Right at the end of the TED Talk, I say, they're not bonsai trees, they're wildflowers. And I remember it was a live audience, of course, and I think they all burst into applause. It was a very moving moment. And I do, there's so many visuals that that serve well as metaphors for how we should parent and what overparenting looks like. But the thing about the bonsai tree metaphor that I love so much is it's this a lovely, perfect replica of a real tree. It's diminutive. We can put it in a pot and put it on our coffee table or on our patio. And it, you know, it's a mighty oak that's been reduced to its miniature form. And every branch has been perfectly pruned to create the shape we, the gardener, desire. But the metaphor is, you know, this is what we're doing to our kids. We're we're planting them in a certain pot that we've picked, which is sort of where we live and what they'll do. And we're clipping and pruning them so they resemble the tree we have in mind. But who are we to clip and prune someone else's life journey, right? Who are we to say, you must be a doctor or you have to study piano or you don't meet with my approval. I don't, I'm not proud of you. I don't love you unless you are pursuing uh, engineering right? What are we doing? Why, why do we think that's an okay to treat another living being? You know, that mighty oak growing the way it wants to out in a meadow is magnificent. A bonsai tree is, is the work of the gardener to replicate what nature has done. It's, you know, I'm not knocking gardening or bonsai tree gardeners, but to treat a human that way is I think to curtail someone in a way that we have no right to do. 
I mean, yes, we have to treat our kids manners. That is how do you interact with other humans so you can get your own needs met and not step on their toes. You know, we have to teach them good character. We have to teach them a work ethic, but none of those things constrain them. They open them to be able to be wildly successful out in the world. So to value our children uh, or to respect our children as wildflowers, meaning you have no idea actually what this one is. It's starting to come up out of the ground, make sure it has water, make sure it has soil, make sure it has sunlight and stand back and watch it become, you know, that's the, that's the humility of parenting. Like this child is, you know, came through you, but is not your property. This is now I'm quoting Khalil Gibran in the prophet, right? It's a humbling it's a humbling task to raise another human. And we do have obligations to make sure they're fed and sheltered and loved, but it is not our task to chart their journey. It is in fact, arrogant. It is, can be cruel to tell them, no, 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 you will be this. You must do that. Um, so yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that particular metaphor resonated with you. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that listeners are kind of seeing that difference in their minds of the perfectly crafted bonsai tree that looks like a real tree, i.e. a kid who looks like a real human, but who has never really been able to make choices for themselves. Unlike the wildflower that is like, Hey, let me show you who I am. Yeah. I think about so often that we will guide or try to change our child's behavior in one way or another, and, you know, we'll teach them an important lesson. And then we expect that they learn the lesson and that they're going to move forward with that lesson in mind. And then we look at us as parents, as fully grown adults with fully developed brains. And we learn information like this, like you, and you know, that Ted talk, the, the applause afterwards, every time that you've inspired a group of, of adults, a group of parents with this information, they get it. But then before long, as you say in your book, they go back to their neurotic selves, that it's hard to keep that, to make change, even when you have the information. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So guess what, y'all? It may come as a surprise to you, but my guess is not we have neuroses, we have issues, we have stuff we need to work out within our minds, within our psyches, stuff that's making us insecure, fearful, stuff that makes us say, oh, I need to make sure my child does this, pursues this, achieves at this level, and so forth, because I feel my child is a reflection of my worth So I'm going to plow all my effort into doing everything. I'm going to be up all night with a glue gun to make sure my child's project looks amazing and is in on time, right? I'm literally going to do my kids' homework because I'm so afraid that if I just let them do it, they will not be perfect. Therefore, I will look bad. And so we have to ask ourselves, and I know with your background in in psychology and social work and you know, your PhD, like, you know, right. You know that we parents are filling some kind of hole or we're soothing some kind of lack or some want or some need in ourselves by micromanaging our kids, by treating them almost by like little pets in a dog show. Like I'm going to bring my dog to the dog show and prove to everybody what a great dog I've raised, you know, and I'll take the trophy home. Like the kid is our pet. The kid is our project. The kid is the proof of our worth and all of this, and if anyone's listening and nodding and going like, yeah, Julie, push that button on me. Okay. I get it. I've been doing it to my kids too. You know, I've been treating my kids as the proof of how smart I am and how capable I am and how accomplished our family is and so on. And it's just so, so unhealthy. So why do we read the books and see the TED Talks and nod our heads and listen to podcasts and nod our heads further and then go back and replicate? Because it's not as simple as hearing the message. We have to be willing to kind of do the work with a therapist, with a family therapist maybe, where the whole family dynamic gets to be examined, where we're going to do the work of why am I afraid to put a boundary up and tell my child no? Why am I afraid to let my child explore an area of interest that I don't understand or I didn't pursue or I don't appreciate? Why am I needing to um, correct every little thing they do? Why am I doing their homework? You know, 
And um, when we can do the hard work of the therapy, we can ultimately come to a much greater place of ease. And let me tell you, I've been in family therapy. We've been in family therapy for two years now with our now 23-year-old, my my partner and I and, and our son, to really get at the dynamic we've had with this kid who's wonderful, smart, thoughtful, kind, and a little fragile, little sensitive, little anxiety, little ADHD. We've been walking on eggshells around this kid to make life easier. So no, mm-hmm. hardly ever saying no, making the hard things go away, smoothing it over. Not ha- And what we realized is we're, we have to flip the script. We have to be able to say very lovingly, we need to talk about X, Y, and Z. We know this might be hard for you. Let's see if we can try instead of avoiding things, over accommodating a set of fears, uh, for example, turns out not to be a useful way to parent. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm a huge fan for all of us doing the therapeutic psychological work we need to do so that we can be, you know, be less enmeshed with our kids' emotions and, and outcomes and instead be a healthy, whole adult standing near our kids, but not, it, 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 you know, standing far enough away that we're not intertwined with their lives such that they can't lead their own lives. Yeah. Therapy yeah. is the short answer to your question. <laughs> so I I had just finished reading your book and um, this morning I got the email that it was time for Girl Scout cookie season to start. And my daughter is her first year in Girl Scouts. She's in first grade. And she really only joined Girl Scouts because she wanted to sell Girl Scout cookies. So coming fresh off your book, I'm just like, this is it. Like, this is a great opportunity for me just to really hand this to her. You know, I take the supporting role, not the leading role. She figures out what the approach is going to be, who she's going to sell it to, um, a script for selling. She has all of these opportunities to really carve this out for herself. And I was really excited for her. We registered her. And then two hours later, I get this uh, message in the Girl Scout mom group that basically you should only register to sell cookies if you're going to sell a certain amount of cookies, if you're going to meet a threshold that they they have established, because otherwise it brings down the whole group average and, and th- then they make less money for the group. And it all makes sense. But now I'm like, well, crap, like this is on me. Like no. now... I- <laughs> It just, if, and then what went from this like beautiful opportunity for her, now I feel like there's pressure on me oh, and so probably on her. Yeah. It's just, but it's, it's that, you know, we're, tr- we're all trying to do our best, but I, then it's hard know, to make these opportunities for our kids to potentially fail. Talk about missing the forest for the trees, right? Let's step back. <laughs> yeah. What is Girl Scouts? Why does Girl Scouts exist? To help our kids uh, learn skills develop competence, maybe even mastery at some point as they age, develop confidence, begin to be in the world in ways that are distant from us, which is so important. And in the book, I think I wrote about the absurdity of Girl Scout cookie sales when the parents are doing all the work, when the parents are seated seated behind the table and the parents are restocking the inventory. And when Mm -hmm. the person walks by and says to the girl, oh, hey, are you selling cookies? And the parent says, yes, we are. You know, like, stop. I just yeah. want to say, stop <laughs> earning the badge. Stop <laughs> doing the work. You are ruining it. You are right. ruining Girl Scouts for the girls. Like, you've done this. You've been eight. You've been 12. Like, stop. And what I want to say in this context is, to go back to your group, why are we so interested in having the right uh, average such that we're now basically incentivizing parents to get out there and sell with their girls to keep those numbers up. Like, isn't whatever goal is achieved by doing that has to be smaller than the goal of the girls are motivated, the girls did it themselves, the girls are proud of their own numbers, right? The self-organizing, that potential that could be there. Yeah. 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 Well, and then that ends up me buying like 50 boxes of cookies and I'm trying to offset the cost of the dues when I probably could have just paid the dues and saved like 20,000 calories. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I, I think it's it's interesting to think about that as this this example of how we it's hard to find the opportunities to let our kids self-organize and to let our kids take the initiative. Because, you know, you talk about a lot of examples about 
not being able to leave the, leave kids in the car while you run into the post office and um, letting them run into the store by themselves and how often I know for me, my hesitation in doing that is that I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> right. So boy, have norms changed. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we want kids to be safe. We all want that. Um, it goes without saying. We've become a safetyist culture where we've decided there are so many potential dangers around and that the solution to that is to sequester our kids away. And we've really overblown the degree of danger. And we've forgotten that a kid is only going to develop the skills to be out in the world at a store, on a sidewalk, at a park by practicing it, you know, along the way of childhood. And so again, back to letgrow.org, which is an organization I really admire, they're going to say to local legislatures, for example, why are you saying kids are not allowed home alone until they're 12? That seems absurdly high. You know, they're not allowed home alone until they're 12, but they can marry without a parent's consent at 16. Oh, so they've got four years in which to learn how to like take care of business at home and then they can go get married. It's, it shows you that the past has not kept up with the present in terms of these mm-hmm. norms. I mean, marrying without a parent's consent at 16 seems absurdly low in this day and age. And so what are what are we going to do to say, hey, no, we want kids to be able to walk to and from school as of a certain age, maybe fourth grade feels right or third grade. How can we get law enforcement on board with that? How can we get schools on board with that? Local community organizations to say in our community, Kids are allowed on the street. We want kids on the sidewalks. We want kids in the parks, right? Because that's good for their development because they need to be outside because they need to not be constantly under the hovering watch of people who make them feel anxious. I mean, let's, let's pretend we're children for a moment looking up at the faces of worried adults who constantly feel that we're in danger. We parents are transmitting our fears and our anxiety through our eyes and our body language to our kids. In fact, here's a beautiful example, if I may say so. I'm patting myself on the back right now. I shouldn't. But my kid in his baby book, my 23-year-old in his baby book, which is right in this room that I'm speaking with you from, there's a picture of him at like six or eight months old. He's It's winter. He's we've, My partner and I have taken him to the park for the first time. And we're at the baby park, you know, for infants to five-year-olds. And here he is. He's eight months old. It's winter. He's all bundled up in a fleece that starts at at a hood and like mittens and like a onesie fleece, you know, for winter. And we put him on this slide and the angle of the slide must have been like, you know, 45. I mean, I don't know. It's like a very casual slide. Okay. It's for little ones. And we put him on it and I'm on one side of him and my partner's on the other. And our kid looks terrified. And for years I said, in fact, the caption I put in the baby book is Sawyer's afraid, you know, Sawyer's first slide, first time on the slide, he doesn't like it. And then I realized our faces looking at him were faces of terror. Like, oh my God, you're on the slide. Are you going to be okay? This is your first slide. Like, we wore looks of worry and he was just looking at us, reflecting what he saw. We taught yeah. our child to be afraid. Because we were. And Mm -hmm. that goes back to the work we parents need to do to get our fears out of the way so that our kids can freely grow. We're going to pause for a two-minute word from today's sponsors. Our first sponsor for today is Indeed. Think about someone who has changed your life for the better. How incredible would it be if your company could find more of these people right when you need them? If you're hiring, you need Indeed. You can find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. What I love about Indeed is it's simple. You can find everything you need right in one place. For example, the feature Instant Match. Candidates that you invite to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in a search. Indeed knows that when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit indeed.com slash families to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash families. Indeed.com slash families. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing is not available for everyone. 
If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Our second and final sponsor for today is PrepDish. PrepDish has been a pivotal part of our family for many years now. PrepDish is a meal planning service. It's a PDF that lands in your inbox every week. It's broken down into three simple parts. The first is the ingredient list, so you know what to buy. The second is the prep day list, so you know how you can simply prep your ingredients in advance in a way that is streamlined. And the third and final part is dish day. These are the final steps that you can execute on the day of serving the dish. It only takes 10 or 15 minutes because you've done all the hard work ahead of time. I encourage you to try prep dish. If you feel like you're scrambling around at dinner time, never know what you're gonna make, where everything that you want to make is too labor intensive, especially during this hectic time of the day, go to preptish.com forward slash families. That's preptish.com forward slash families and you'll get two weeks free. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Julie. I'm thinking about just sort of the impact of the community that you're in too, and the, the, the parents that surround you. My daughter walks around the corner to her friend's house. And, um, it's interesting how there are sort of everyone offers up their opinion about whether or not she should be walking to her friend's house where we've had some positive commentary where I'll, I'll see another parent walking the dog and say, Oh wow, I love seeing kids out by themselves. And then another one, does your mom know that you're out here by yourself? (laughs) And how everyone seems to want to offer their two cents about what your child, who they don't know from any other kid, is capable of. And how I know what she's capable of and I know what's safe for her and I have to make those decisions. But I, it feels like I can't even do that anymore because I've got the opinions of well, like 10 other people, including maybe the local Facebook group that might take a picture of her and say, Hey, like this is, I found, I saw this kid on the street. Like yeah. <laughs> right. so, who knows? I would get an article in the local newspaper. I would write an op-ed. I would figure out who my par- parental peers are who are like-minded. I would form a group. I would really be lobbying, you know, at your local school level, like let's promote kids walking. Let's promote what the safe routes are in terms of traffic and in terms of visibility and all of that. And you could also, you know, Lenore Skenazy, who wrote Free Range Kids, who's founded Let Grow, which obviously I'm a huge fan of, advocates that you have a note that's pinned to your kid's backpack or that she can take with her so that when an adult stops her, she can just show the note that says... I'm not lost or I'm not neglected. I'm a free range kid and I'm allowed to walk. You know, I'm building skills because I'm walking by myself. Thank you for your concern, but I'm fine. You know? Yeah. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to try that for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I get a lot of questions from parents about chores and tell me in your mind, how you differ life skills and chores and sort of the intersection of those two things. Um, Yeah. So I didn't realize chores were important until I began researching how to raise an adult. And, you know, my own kids were, I'm embarrassed to say, they were 12 and 10 at the time, and they hadn't done any chores. And I read about this long-term longitudinal study of humans that showed effectively that professional success in life, in, in one's adult years, seems to have been predicted by whether you did chores as a child. And the inference is chores build a work ethic. Chores build a sense of, hey, you are part of a larger unit. You have to contribute to it. You know, it all functions when we all do our part. Um, Michaeline Duclef has written a beautiful book called Hunt, Gather, Parent, where she talks about chores as uh, uh, basically being a way that a kid has a membership card in the family. It's like, I belong to this family. I do work for the family. Uh, We don't want to burden our kids with so many chores that they're indentured servants, you know, that it's violating child labor laws, but it's, it's asking them to participate in the upkeep of the house. That's not cruel. That's helping them build skills and a sense of belonging. So um, I think chores are in some ways the very local, obvious uh, daily, weekly opportunity to build life skills. So you're going to need to know how to clean things up. Let's start with a kitchen. You know, you've, you're going to have to learn how to throw trash away. Let's start with the garbage and recycling. You know, you're going to have to learn how to put things away. Let's start with the dishes in the dishwasher. Let's get our, you know, get our laundry done. All, you know, so they're, they're in some ways the, the, the most basic life skills. And then we can extrapolate to something that's not a chore, but more of a task 
builds a skill. Let's learn how to use the stove so that we can cook a meal. Um, let's learn how to cross the street safely so that we can get places. Um, and, and what I promote is this four step method for teaching a skill, whether it's a chore or, uh, less of a chore and more of a life skill. First, you do it for them, which we're really good at because we're constantly doing it for them. Step two, you do it with them where you're narrating out loud to how it works and using your teaching voice and nice and slow so they can pay attention, but they're there paying attention. Step three, they're the one doing it, but you're still there just in case something terrible goes wrong. And step four, they can finally, they've, you know, you've practiced step two to get to step three. You've practiced step three to get to step four where they can do it without you. And, um, you know, it's terrifying in those first few moments when they're making a meal on the stove without you or crossing the street in your town without you. But, you know, we're not giving these tasks to three-year-olds. We might be giving these tasks to eight-year-olds though, 10-year-olds, right? If you fail to teach, then you have a 15-year-old who's really helpless in the kitchen or who really feels insecure or uncomfortable out there in the world. And they're out there with their peers after school and they don't feel comfortable crossing the street because you've never taught them, you know? And so then they're left to sort of try to figure it out with friends and they're feeling a little silly or you've never let your kid learn to, to um, cut their own meat right? I hear from parents who are like, Julie, I've heard your story about you were cutting Sawyer's meat when he was 10, which was my aha mortifying moment. And I'm like, yeah, funny how they're like, yeah, I'm still cutting my 16 year old's meat. A mom said to me, and I thought she was joking. So I laughed and she laughed and she's like, I know. Right. But it's just easier. And that's how I knew she wasn't joking. And I was like, what's your long-term plan? You know, she's like, I don't know. I said, what does he do when you're not there to cut it? She says, he just stabs the food with a fork and lifts the whole thing up. And I said, you know, you're really setting him up to be mocked or to not Mm. get a job because he's going to be on a job interview and he's going to pick up food that way or not clearly not know how to use a knife and fork. And without an obvious disability presenting, he's going to be judged, you know, by that potential employer or by his peers who are going to laugh at him or he'll be on a date, you know come on, this is not yeah. healthy. Yeah. Well, I wonder too, if sometimes chores feel so hard for us as parents, because those four steps you just outlined, they don't necessarily equate to four instances, right? Like one oh. time you show them, like oh, me, you yeah. might need to show them 10 times, or they yeah. might need to practice it 40 times, that yeah. that process can be slow. So let's speak to what impedes our ability to lean into that. We're so overtaxed. We're so busy. We're constantly on the go, partly because we have, you know, we've got work and we've got life, but we've got our kids in five activities. And so it's a carpool. We've got to go like, I don't have time to teach you to tie your shoes today becomes my kid can't tie their shoes Mm -hmm. well beyond when you and I learned to tie shoes, right? We have to slow down enough, bring enough patience and enough grace to these tasks. So we can say, Hey buddy, let me teach. It's time to learn how to tie that. Let's not have them in Velcro shoes all their lives. Let's teach them how to tie. It's complicated. It takes some figuring out. They also have to bathe themselves. Mm -hmm. I've had parents of prepubescent kids, 11 years old saying they're still bathing their child. And at some point that becomes quite a privacy violation. That kid needs autonomy over their body. They need to know how to wash their body before they need the privacy. (laughs) You're supposed to have taught them, right? How to do all these things. You know, people are wiping their kids behinds too long. Like, come on folks, what is your long-term strategy, Mm -hmm. right? You're so hurried in the moment or need it to be just your way in the moment that you're letting your own rush or your own perfectionism and control needs override your primary parental task, which is teach them to do for themselves. Right. And then we end up absolutely overloaded and overwhelmed because we're doing all the things for our kids and they haven't taken on any of those responsibilities. College students can't wake themselves up because they've never learned how. Because a parent thought, I have to do it. I have to do it. I have to do it. And then the kid is off at college and the parent's paying all this money and feels like, oh my God, my kid's not going to know how to wake up. Well, yeah. And you did that to them and that's on you. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So tell us more about kids growing up failure deprived. How can we change our perspective on failure and why it's important yeah. not needed to be avoided? You know, I live in Silicon Valley and the designers and engineers here have this mantra, fail your way forward. And they're not literally praising failure as if failure is the goal. Obviously, they want to be wildly successful and achieve. What they're saying is, we won't get to the best design outcome. We won't get to the best solution, the best product, the best result, unless we're willing to try and screw up and learn from the screw up. That's the key. Failure, falling, fumbling, I call them life's beautiful F words. These things are our greatest teachers. And so instead of, oh no, my kid's um, gonna, you know, that project isn't as beautifully done as it could be. She's going to get, you know, a lower grade than she might if I, if I didn't work on it or, oh no, my kid, you know, was, you know, a little unkind to that other kid. And, and now that kid is mad at them. And I, I need to step in so that my kid doesn't have that hurt feeling, you know, whatever it is, actually our kid, what needs to have the experience and then we need to unpack it with them. So how did that feel? How are you feeling? How do you think your friend is feeling? You know, what might you do differently next time? Help them do some critical thinking about it so that they build the understanding about what they might do differently next time on the homework, in the play date, you know, with the chore, whatever it is. We have to, you know, not be so worried about the outcome in the moment that we end up uh, smoothing it, handling it, fixing it for them. So they achieve the right outcome now, but we've deprived them of learning the lesson. That means they can achieve it for themselves next time or the time after or the time after that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as parents on autopilot, it's very easy to lean towards this imperative language. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. Instead of using words like, I wonder if, or I'm curious about, and prompting our kids to think about solutions for themselves. And that that takes more time, that conversation to unfold. Like you, when you know in your mind what the best thing to do is, and you can just tell your kid the best thing to do, that's so much faster and more time efficient than wondering and evoking curiosity in kids. Yeah. So if we're, um, you know, and, and we need another metaphor, it's like, this isn't a race, this isn't a timed race. And if we're that pressured for time, we have to look at what can I pull back on? What can I give up so that I can slow down my language with my kids and give them the room to grow rather than yanking them out the door, having tied their shoes and dress them for them and put their homework in their backpack because I'm in such a hurry. Okay. That's that's just so critical. We have to examine our lives and, and build more time in. Um, yeah. And we have to let go of our perfectionism. Of course, you can yeah. staff the dishwasher more effectively. <laughs> You've got all the practice, right? And you don't have to, it's not helpful, like have your kids stack the dishwasher and then you hate how they stacked it. So secretly you go back in and fix it. Don't do that. The next day, with a smile on your face, when you're unloading the dishwasher, say, hey, buddy, let me show you something. You see how you've put this plate right up against this one? That makes it virtually impossible for the water and soap to get in there to clean that one. So see, there's still stuff stuck on it. That's what happens. So next time, how about you try spacing them farther apart so that the soap and water can get in there? How does that sound, right? Or you can use the, I'm curious, why do you think the, you know, the mm -hmm. food is still stuck on this one, right? But all of those options are better than you just secretly fixing it. That's like secretly right. staying up with the glue gun to fix their, to fix their project right. at night rather than teaching them. Yeah. Or the shameful response, which would be what's wrong with you. Can't you lo load the dishwasher? Correct. And of I think course. some of us yeah. lean towards that. You're right. Especially if we were raised like that. Right. Too. Yeah. So I think that so many of us, you know, we know we know these things on some core basic level, but it takes this ongoing conviction. And I think revisiting these topics, you know, hearing these conversations, reading books like yours to really drive it home. You know, like I said, I think I was familiar with a lot of the things that in, that you wrote about in your book. However, now reading this as a parent of a seven and nine year old versus, you know, when I read books on this topic five or to seven years ago, 
it hit me different at this age, right? Yeah. Getting closer to puberty, getting close, raising more able-bodied kids that are able to do things that they're not doing and very well could be doing. So I think that that frequent exposure to this topic and the revisiting of it, because it is going against the grain of society in most cases. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's going against the grain, but when we've read the books and listened to the podcasts and really understand the philosophy, uh, I think we can become motivated to do the right thing. You know, in the back of how to raise an adult, as you may remember, it's just part four is kind of how to be the parent who can parent differently. And it's just two chapters and it's how to reclaim yourself, how to reclaim your voice in your community with peers, with friends, when they try to, to say, why are you doing that? Or how could, you know, oh, I could never let my kid do that, or implying that you're neglectful. It's I offer actual language that people can emulate to try to develop the response that's going to leave you feeling empowered and good rather than, you know, judged by your friend. Um, and look, when I said, you know, we have to remember what our purpose is as parents, it is this, it is to remember that one day we will be dead and gone. And that like any, I know that's hard for us to say and feel, and obviously we don't want to contemplate our own mortality yet. It is a truth. And like any mammal parent, we're supposed to teach our little ones how to be okay out there without us. And we get years as humans. I mean, dogs get like six or eight weeks and lions get like five or seven years and humans get like 18 to 25 years, you know? And, and yeah, we do hope to see them around the jungle <laughs> after they <laughs> left our home and like, Hey, we love you still. But we, we, we get this deep, juicy satisfaction when we see our kid succeeding out in the world without us, there's a little mm. buzz that we get like, yeah, thank goodness they can pay their bills. They can keep track of their stuff. They can talk to strangers. You know, they can turn in their obligations. Like they can take public transportation. They can make food. Like we get this deep satisfaction. It's like psychological knowing like, yep, yep. My offspring has successfully fledged the nest. They are they are good. They can fly out there in the world. I hope to still see them. I hope we have this loving relationship forever, but they've got this, you know, and outside yeah. of significant disability, that is our imperative. Make sure that this one can thrive without me. Not yeah. I will always be by your side, but I have prepared you to walk alone. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what reclaiming yourself has looked like for you, especially in the last few years as, as your kids have grown? Sure thing. The pandemic did interrupt uh, everything for all of us. I my, Let's see, my kids are 23 and 21. So when the pandemic hit, they were 20 and 18. And um, we had them both come home. We had an empty nest. Um, reclaiming myself was in those empty nest years was in part reckless abandon with my partner, my husband, Dan. We were like, oh my gosh, we have a house. That's just us. We don't have to, no one's, no one needs food from us. No one needs a <laughs> car. No one needs a drive. You know, like we were sort of like teenagers again with each other, like to keep this G rated. We like our, our relationship leveled up and it was fantastic. Um, and we had managed to stay in love all those years, which, you know, is so important. We have to make room for our primary relationship if we have one along the way, rather than try to rediscover that person when our last kid leaves the nest. So we had done the work along the way, but now it was like, oh, hey, it's, you know, it's like a honeymoon back at our house. Um, and I say all of this to just underscore that our primary interpersonal romantic relationships are hugely important. We need that. We want that. If we have it, if we don't have it, we want to go find that, you know? Um, so that's been enormous. Um, I think I've had more time to focus on my own self, my, my own health, which I had kind of neglected, uh, not going to the doctor, not going to go get things checked out, you know, with, with, uh, I'm not, this is something we should do while our kids are, are still under our roof. But I have to admit, I had kind of been neglecting those things and I've leaned in more to that. And, um, I'm just, I gotta say, I'm enjoying 
watching my relationship with my kids change, like listening when my daughter calls from college 3000 miles away, when she had problems, you know, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. I've got to do this. And this is broken for in her freshman year. I was eager to tell her how to fix it. Oh, don't do that. Do this. She was like, mom, I'm just venting. Just stop. I don't need, Mm -hmm. I'm not asking for advice. And I've learned to slow down my impulse to fix and handle. And instead, the most loving thing is empathy and then empower, which is, oh, honey, that sounds so frustrating. Are you all right? Yuck. Ugh. You know, pause. Mm -hmm. Let her come back with more of what she wants to say. She just wants to be heard. If I feel the impulse, I can say, you know, are you looking for advice or do you just want to vent? I'm here for both or either. And -hmm. give her the choice. Secretly, I'm hoping she'll say, yes, mom, I want advice. But but I've learned that I make myself safe for her if I don't impose the advice. If I offer it without need, you know, without yearning, if I just offer it objectively, let me know if you need advice or if you just want to vent. I'm good for whatever you need, baby. Step back. Gives her room to step forward. I'm really proud of the ways I've grown and changed in response to both kids. You know, I have repatterned with them both in their early twenties and I'm, you know, I've written about this and I try to be vulnerable about my own stumbles and fumbles, both in the book we're discussing how to raise an adult, but also in my regular blog, Julie's pod, I often write about my parenting journey. And in fact, I'm going to give you a couple links, one on, um, over accommodating my son's, uh, various you know, sensitivities and one I call freeing my daughter from the cage of me where my Mm -hmm. need for her to be a certain way was really caging her in. And that, that really was brought home to me starkly when I visited her for parents weekend at college freshman year and my need for a picture and my need for, um, things to go a certain way was just stifling her. And finally we had a blowout fight where I told her I felt disrespected and, you know, I made it all about me. And she told my son, her older brother, if mom behaves that way again, I'm not coming home for Thanksgiving. And I was like, what? I didn't see myself as the problem at all. Yeah. I was able to pull back and, you know, bring my mindfulness practice in and try to acknowledge my own fears and insecurities and, and really recognize that, wow, I'm really pushing my daughter away from me instead of doing what I'm trying to do, which is to draw her close. So, um, Anyway, I, I will share those links with you so that yes, you can share with your folks. Because uh, this is hard. It is hard. We are works in progress. Parenting is hard. We're doing our best. I'm not trying to blame us as parents. I'm not trying to flog myself constantly. But I'm going to reframe it as I'm trying to learn and grow. And I believe I can. And I believe my relationships with others, including my children, including my own mother, including my friends, including my partner can improve if I'm willing to do the work to examine where are my prickly places? Where are my places of deep need? Where are my insecurities? Why they're there is a whole nother inquiry and that deserves therapy too. But if I can just be more mindful that they exist, then I can be in charge of myself and not impose these, you know, these sort of emotional lacks and longings on other people. I can be a little bit more self-regulated out in the world which is better for me and better for them. And I am all about that. And the rewards have been bountiful. I love that. Those words are so wise. I think so many will benefit from that. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate your time today. Oh, I appreciate you. And I want to say to everyone listening, thanks for spending all this time with me and Danae. Whatever came up for you as we talked, we can't know what is going to resonate or did resonate, but that's a clue from you to you that we were saying something that maybe you want to be more curious about. Whether you totally disagreed with us or were nodding your head or tearing up a little, you know, this is your own self giving you a little bit of information that you might want to take forward. And we encourage you to, I can't speak for today, but I encourage you to. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been episode 340. If you want to get in touch with Julie or any of the things we talked about today, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 340. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. When you have a moment, please leave a rating or review for this podcast. I'll talk with you soon.